I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 19. And we want to look at the crucifixion of Christ today. I know it's Palm Sunday. And because we've been working our way through the Gospel of John, um, the triumphal entry that we celebrate in that last week of Jesus' life occurs in John chapter 12. And we're all the way in John chapter 19. And I think I've pointed out to you it is that John's emphasis, almost half of his gospel, takes place in the last week of Jesus' life. So if it feels like we've come a long way in John's gospel since we talked about that triumphal entry, it's because we have. That was literally months ago that we uh, looked at that part of the gospel, but that was only a week ago, not even a week, in the life of Jesus as far as the, um, the suffering of Christ in that last week. But today we want to look at John chapter 19 and we'll um, pick up where we left off after Jesus has now faced a religious trial of some sorts and now a civil trial in front of uh, Pilate and Herod. Uh, now we come to the actual suffering and death of Christ. We finished last week with verse 16 in John chapter 19 where it says, Finally Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. It goes on to say that so the soldiers took charge of Jesus carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had, no, had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priest of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. This is what the soldiers did. Near the cross, of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and another scripture says they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. 
This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. May God bless his word to us this day. I've gotten to know a, a, a novel that's probably familiar to many of you. I didn't read it as a child, but my, both of my children have. And so um, starting, I don't know, three or four years ago when they first began to have to read it for school, I read along with them to try to help them study for quizzes and write papers and things like that. The book is Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, and it's gotten to be a favorite of mine. I really enjoy that story. I think it's well written. It seems familiar in some ways of someone who spent my whole life in the South, not quite old enough to remember that era of the South. But there's a, a scene towards the end of that novel that is kind of a courtroom drama. And it wouldn't be out of place to see such a scene play out on one of the modern television shows like Law and Order or CSI, one of those kinds of things. And there's this high moment in the trial where Atticus Finch, who's the lawyer, kind of the hero in the story, he is defending Tom Robinson, a man who is falsely accused of attacking Mayella Yule. He, he's accused by not only her, but her father. And in this high point of the trial, he dramatically gives evidence that Tom Robinson couldn't possibly have committed this crime. Mayola ha Mayella has a, a sign of a bruise on her right cheek. And he shares that in order to be struck on the right cheek, you would be struck by the left hand. And he demonstrates in the courtroom that Tom Robinson has no use of his left arm. And then he goes on to point the finger at who actually attacked Mayella, and it was her own father, Bob, and he tosses something in dramatic fashion across the courtroom, and Bob catches it in his left hand, and he demonstrates that he is the left-handed person who struck his own daughter. Well, the evidence presented there, not just that, but even some of their own testimony points the finger not at the man on trial, but at the father of this young woman. The evidence is formidable, and after this high point of the trial, Atticus and the defense rest. The evidence has been given, and the outcome is now expected. Well, I think John's gospel now is coming to a conclusion, this high point where John now is giving us his last pieces of strong evidence for who Jesus is. He's made a case throughout this whole gospel that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God, and he's the expected prophesied Messiah that's come to save his people from their sins. And the evidence at times seems overwhelming. We've, as we've worked our way through this gospel through the fall and now through the winter and the beginning part of this spring, we've seen that Jesus has done miraculous things. He's turned water into wine. He's healed the sight of a blind man. He's even raised a man from the dead. Jesus' own teaching points to him as being one of authority. Jesus even gives evidence that he himself claims to be the king of the Jews. But even here in his death, which seems in some people's eyes now to go against all those claims, that many in that day and even to this day can't see that a king, the son of God, would die in such a manner. And I think in this second half of John chapter 19, he gives us at least five pieces of evidence that would point to who Jesus is. And John's kind of bringing together, he's often pointed us back to the Old Testament and says, this Jesus is the one that has always been pointed to for many, many years before. And so these five things, I want to present them to you as evidence, these final pieces that John gives us are these, the prophetic fulfillment, the proper name that's given to Jesus, the picture of the love of Christ that's presented to us, Jesus' own perfect knowledge of what was going on, and finally, the proof of changed lives, which may be the strongest and most immediate proof that we'll see, not just then, but even today.
But let's talk about this prophetic fulfillment. Did you notice when we read through there, it said several times, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled? I hope you know that for uh, all of the history of the Bible, beginning in the very beginning chapters of Genesis, there are things that point us to the need of a Messiah and the actual coming of one who can save his people from the sin that has always been part of our lives. And here in just this short span, John points to at least eight, probably more than that, eight different things that we could look at and say these were in direct fulfillment of the scriptures. And I don't want to delve into all those in depth, but just so you know, something as simple as Jesus carrying his own cross um, is a fulfillment of a prophecy that was a picture in the, in the life of Abraham and Isaac. You remember that story when Abraham took his own son to be sacrificed and Isaac carried the wood for himself to be sacrificed there. Jesus has always been a picture, a fulfillment of the picture of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So even in something as simple as that is a kind of fulfillment. But much of what John gives here is more direct even than that. The fact that Jesus was crucified is fulfillment of Psalm 22 where it says that the Messiah's hands and feet will be pierced by nails. And he's fulfilling the type again from the Old Testament. This picture in the Old Testament in John chapter 3 when Jesus shared with Nicodemus about that bronze serpent that was lifted up in the desert that brought healing to people who were bitten by fiery serpents. Jesus says, just as that snake was lifted up, so must I be lifted up. And it was that picture of him being lifted on the cross. Isaiah chapter 53 prophesied that the Messiah would be crucified with criminals. And John tells us that in fact, Jesus was crucified between those two criminals. Psalm 22 also prophesies much of the, of the crucifixion, but it even prophesies that his clothes would be gambled for. It, Psalm 69 prophesies that wine vinegar would be given to the Messiah in his time of suffering and thirst. Psalm 34 prophesies that no bones of the Messiah will be broken. And John goes out of his way to explain why all that happened. That they wanted the, the men off of the crosses before the Passover came. And so they were ordered to go and break the legs so the men would die sooner. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. And so his bones were not broken. Just as the bones of a Passover lamb at sacrifice were not to be broken. And it says instead Jesus' side was pierced. That in itself is a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 12. Now why do we point so much to those things. Because John wants us to know about the fulfillment of these prophecies. The reason why prophecy is so important because it's an indication of the divine authorship of these scriptures. It's not just John writing these, but God wants us to know the facts of Jesus' life and death. And the facts of his life point to the fulfillment of these predictions, some very, very long since having been given. In fact, um, anybody can make a prediction about the future, right? We could say today what's going to happen tomorrow, the next day, or 20 years, or 200 years from now. But the fulfillment is really the important part of it. And I want to share this with you. This is something I heard as a teenager many years ago, and it's shared in lots of different places. I heard Josh McDowell, who some of you may know his name. He's been a writer and, and speaker about a case for Christ and, and things like that. But some of this I heard for the first time as a teenager, and it really made an impact on me. And I want you to know this, that, um, that these things being fulfilled, even if it was just these small things from these, this small portion of Scripture, that the odds of something randomly happening to fulfill such things are so minuscule, it's mind-blowing. Uh, take, for example, what the likelihood of a per person predicting today the exact city in which the birth of a future leader would take place well into several centuries ahead. This is indeed what the prophet Micah did 700 years before Jesus was born. There was a predictive prophecy that the Messiah would be born, in fact, in Bethlehem. 
Further, what's the likelihood of predicting the precise manner of death, a manner of death that's presently not even known or practiced? What would be the odds of that being accurately predicted? In fact, David did that a thousand years before the coming of Christ. And again, what's the likelihood of predicting the specific date of the appearance of some great future leader hundreds of years in advance? That's what Daniel did 530 years before Christ. Now let me paint this picture, and this is what I remember hearing in my youth, and I still picture this today. If these are eight different prophecies, and it doesn't have to be these eight that we've looked at this morning, but pick any of the eight, and there's actually several hundred prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. But if we just took eight, um, there's been mathematicians and scholars who have gone to figure out the probability of eight random prophecies being fulfilled in one person in history and time. And these have been done. 600 students worked on this collectively at several universities. It was verified by mathematicians um, through the Association of Scientific Affiliation and so forth and so on. But here's the number they came up with. The odds of eight prophecies being fulfilled randomly in one person in space and time is 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Now, if it's been a long time since you've been in a math class, the easiest way to, to see that number is it's 10 with 17 zeros after it. 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Well, that's hard to grasp and be even hard to write that number out. And even then, what would it really mean to us? Well, this is the picture that I remember hearing, and it's, um, it's dramatic. Suppose we take 10 to the 17th power silver dollars, and we lay them on the face of the state of Texas and just lay them out. They'll cover the whole entire state two feet deep. Now, mark one of those silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he can pick one silver dollar and say that it is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one with the right marking? Just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in one man from their day to the present time, providing that they wrote them on their own wisdom. The whole state of Texas in silver dollars, two feet deep, a random chance of picking one out of there. Now, if you increase that number only to 48 prophecies, the number goes up to 10 to the 157th power. You can imagine, I would assume, covers the whole United States two feet deep in that. What's the point of all those things? What's the point of John pointing out several times here so that prophecy would be fulfilled, so that the word of Scripture would be fulfilled is he wants us to know that the most dramatic piece of evidence he can present is Jesus is who they said he would be. And there's no chance. One to the 17th power means there's no chance. And so Either Jesus is who he says he was or all of this is completely made up in nonsense and we waste our time even talking about it. And so the first and most dramatic piece of evidence is just the sheer numbers that would be required for this to be randomly taking place. And John wants us to know, even in those small details about being given vinegar and not water on the cross, for his side to be pierced and his bones to not be broken, that he's crucified and that he's not hung or beheaded or all the other things, or even stoned, which really should have been his punishment from the Jews, but they didn't want to do it, and so they handed him over to the Romans to be crucified, a death that only the Romans would bring. But then I like some of the other evidence that he gives here. It's not just this prophetic fulfillment. It's even the name that's given to Jesus. And I like that 
here, not only Pilate is giving a little jab to the Jewish leaders, but I think John might even be doing that a little bit as well. Did you catch that part? It kind of makes me smile as I read through that. It says that Pilate put on the cross a sign, which would have been customary, is the charge against the one being executed is publicly displayed there of being a murderer or whatever it might be. In Jesus' case, there was no charge that the Roman government could bring against him. We talked about that last week. He was not guilty of any crime against Rome. It was the Jews that wanted him crucified. And the reason is because he claimed to be the king of the Jews. And so Pilate wrote in three different languages so everybody could clearly see and understand Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. It's one problem that the Jewish people had with that. They said, don't write he is the king of the Jews. Write that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. We don't think he's our king. And Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. He says, too late. It's up there. Deal with it. And isn't it interesting in the course of history that God would see fit that a sign above Jesus' head doesn't say he claims to be the king of the Jews. But Pilate has written what he has written. His name is Jesus, the king of the Jews. We also get this sweet picture of love that demonstrates the great love of Christ for all people, but we get it shown here to his very own mother who is gathered with a small group of people at the foot of the cross, these four women and John, who he calls himself there out of some sort of modesty, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He doesn't want to mention his own name and his own gospel, but it seems clear that he's the one who is there. And he says to his mother, behold your son. And he says to John, behold your, uh, or vice versa, he says to John, behold your mother and to Mary, behold your son. He's entrusting the care of his own mother. But what's interesting there, why did John, and many people have pointed out that the Gospels have told us that Jesus' brothers, up until some point, were not believers in Jesus. In fact, we're told that um, according to John himself in John chapter 7, it says that not even his brothers believed in him. And later on in Mark chapter 3, we read that his own family said that Jesus was out of his mind. And so now Jesus is commending the care of his mother to this beloved disciple. But what's also, I think, important for us here is to know this. Those people standing at the foot of the cross, even his own mother, she probably could have put a stop to all this. Wouldn't she know that if Jesus' claims were really false, she knew where Jesus' birth had originated more than anybody else could have. And even out of the great love of a mother, wouldn't you almost expect Mary to go before Pilate or the Jewish officials and say, I don't know what's wrong with him, but he's not who he says he is. Just stop and have mercy on him. But she doesn't. Why? Because she knows. She knows who Jesus is. And so maybe the most dramatic evidence of who Jesus is comes from his own mother who stands and witnesses the suffering of her own son, but she knows it was for this purpose that he was born. She was told before his birth that he would be the Lamb of God and that she and her own soul would be pierced along with her son. And so that perfect love is shown to us there. The prophetic fulfillment, the proper name, the picture of love, and then Jesus' own perfect knowledge. Now this is just inside information that John gives to us, but he says in verse 28, knowing that everything had now been finished. What does that mean? What had been finished? It's Jesus' work of redemption for his people was now drawing to a close. And even he himself, only there's seven different things that Jesus says during his time on the cross. John only records three of them, but the last one for John um, comes in these things. He says he thirsts, but he also says these words, it is finished. It's one word in the Greek to telestai, and it would be an expression commonly used. It would be the expression that a servant would use when reporting to his or her master that the job is done. It's what a priest would pronounce over a sacrifice saying that it's properly been prepared. It's what a merchant would mark in a ledger to say the debt has been paid. 
Is that a perfect pronouncement that Jesus himself would give? That the job is done? That the sacrifice is acceptable and the debt has been paid? And notice that it says when Jesus has said this, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. John has gone to great lengths to remind us that Jesus' life was not taken from him. It was given by him. When Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, he said, I lay down my life for my sheep. No one takes it from me. And even here in this subtle way, I think John reminds us that he gave his life and it was not taken. And it's his perfect knowledge that all things have now been fulfilled. All of those many, many prophecies leading to this high moment in history, now it's done. It is finished. And the very last thing I think that maybe is always so powerful, you know this kind of testimony. You know people in your life that the proof of the reality of Jesus Christ is in their own lives. If you've known a before and after in so many people, you know what a great transformation that an encounter with Jesus Christ can make. And here we get the benefit of the last paragraph in this chapter, two men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who we've met before. And John tells us a little bit about each. He says, Joseph of Arimathea, both of these men, Joseph and Nicodemus, were of the ruling council. They were of these Jewish religious leaders who are seeking to kill Jesus. But we find that they are followers and disciples of Christ. And in this moment, having encountered the real Jesus and his suffering and through these trials, now they're willing to openly accept and proclaim who Christ is. And they take his body and having already prepared for the burial, 75 pounds of spices have been gathered and strips of linen to wrap him and place him in this tomb that Joseph came by. A king that no one else had ever been placed in. That's the stuff of kings. That amount of spices and that preparation for burial in a tomb hewn out only for one person would have been for someone very special. And so these two have seen for themselves. They've lived in this world of rules and regulations. They had watched people tremble underneath that heavy burden. They had heard about all this senseless wrangling over legalistic details of keeping the law. And in this moment, they throw it all off. Do you remember last week, when we, or two weeks ago, when they came to the garden to arrest Jesus, um, that when the Jewish people took Jesus away, do you remember why they didn't want to go into Pilate's palace? John told us that they didn't want to go in there because they didn't want to become ceremonial un ceremonially unclean so that they could celebrate the Passover. This is now on the eve of the Passover, and these two Jewish religious leaders take a dead body of Jesus, which would rule them ceremonial unclean for a long period of time. And so they're casting off this legalistic sense of, I have to do this and I can't do that in order to be right with God. And they proclaim for all the world, including us today, is there's something more important than the rules and the regulations and the religiosity of things. It is Jesus himself is to be embraced. And in a few short hours after this story that we've read today concludes, the world's going to be turned on its head. One of the more dramatic pieces of evidence will now come to the forefront the very next or, or two mornings after this. You won't believe what happens. I bet you do. Some of you do because you know the story. But you should know that overwhelming evidence doesn't always carry the day, does it? John's provided more than ample evidence, not just in this chapter, but I think just here has been enough, but throughout this whole gospel of who Jesus really was. But you know that story from To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Finch brings this overwhelming evidence, and yet Tom Robinson goes to jail. And if you know that story, he goes to jail despite 
his clear innocence in it. Tom Robinson is a black man accused by a white family. And then that fictional time and place is representative of a time in history where prejudice in the hearts of that jury was more important than plain evidence presented to them. How many of you know that's the life that many lead? That there's something in our own hearts, maybe it's not racial prejudice, but it's sin. It's blindness in our own hearts that presents us from fully accepting clear evidence of who Jesus is. And there's so many that we see every day that don't fully accept the reality of Jesus as the King, the Savior of sinners. And just as Joseph and Nicodemus are proof that God can overwhelm and ov overcome such unbelief, but it's an encounter with Jesus that brings us to that place. And so I'd ask you today, have you had that encounter with Jesus? I'm not naive enough to think that just if I lay out some things about prophecy and probability that you'll go, oh, I finally get it. It's the work of God in our own hearts that if you were at Bible study this week from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it tells us that in order to believe in Jesus, a veil has to be torn away. A veil that clouds our looking at clear evidence. And it says that how does that veil get taken away? It says it's taken away by Jesus himself. And so my invitation to you this day is to have that true encounter with Jesus. To look upon the crucified Christ and to know that his death, and as we celebrate Easter, surely that resurrection is testimony to who Jesus was. And really, we have opportunity of that proof of a changed life. Look around you. There's people sitting right here this morning that have a dramatic testimony that they were saved from sin and death. It's my testimony, and I hope it's yours. And I want you to know this, and the last thing we'll say is what John says himself in the very next chapter, is that these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The evidence is before us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the testimony of the Scriptures, the very Word of God. And we thank you that you've promised us that your Word is useful for teaching, rebu rebuking, for proving and correcting us for righteousness so that we can be equipped for every good work. And so I pray that this day your Word would do its work by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our eyes would be opened to the reality of who Jesus is. And by faith, we would come to accept the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. So we thank you for that, and we look in anticipation to your work in our hearts through it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.